Welcome to the BPD Bunch. I'm your host, Zanny, and today I am here with Alex, Lena, Roth, and Jay. Where in the world is everybody coming from? Australia. We're feeling good. We're feeling energized and full of adrenaline. I'm in Minas Gerais, Brazil. I'm in Calgary, Canada. I'm in New Jersey, United States. New Mexico, United States. So today's topic is brought to you by our patrons over on Patreon. Our top tier patrons get to vote on some of our select episode topics. And today, the topic that won the vote is media portrayals of BPD. So I'm very excited. We watched a bunch of movies and shows that had characters in it who either were officially diagnosed canonically with BPD or are sort of widely accepted by viewers as having BPD. So today we're going to talk about some of those characters and our interpretations of their behavior, how we relate to them, and also how those particular portrayals affect BPD stigma. I do want to give a quick spoiler alert. We are going to do our best not to give too much away, but it is hard to do a deep dive into analyzing characters without some spoilers. So in case there's a show or movie you don't want spoiled for you, we have included the timestamps of what we're covering in the description so that it's easy to skip. So what's a good character to start with? Rebecca Bunch. Rebecca Bunch. A good one! So we'll start with a great representation of BPD. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is one of my absolute favorite shows. Something that's actually very cool about the show is that, you know, they didn't create the character with BPD in mind specifically. They told, I guess, maybe some psychiatrist or psychologist to watch the show and then give their own opinion without saying anything. Um, and they gave the opinion that it looked like borderline personality disorder. So they ended up going with that diagnosis. And um, in the third season of the show, she gets officially diagnosed. Um, they go through the different symptoms. They talk about the BPD stigma. I mean, maybe it's better that they didn't set out with her having BPD because it became a more authentic version of a character with BPD rather than a stereotype. I mean, there are certainly moments where it's a little like, Okay, got it, you know, but um, for the most part, she's a very real person. Obviously, it's a TV show, so it's very dramatized. So like certain things she does are very exaggerated, you know, maybe maybe not all of them, because there are certain things in there that probably to a lot of people would be like, wow, and we're like, yeah, I, I did that last Tuesday or whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> she is a very unique character. When I watch it, I, I see Zanny, like, to me, I feel like I'm watching Zanny sometimes when I'm watching the show. She's very bubbly. She's very, like, very outgoing, very creative and kind of, like, wacky. And um, she goes through these things that are just so relatable. Like, there's these moments where it just feels like watching, like, a mirror in a way. It's like, whoa. I remember when I saw, like, one of the ads for it um, when it first came out. Uh, like, the whole premise girl drops everything and moves across the country for a guy she dated like for two weeks when she was 16 I was like <laughs> I feel called out a little bit <laughs> why am I being attacked right now <laughs> why am I being attacked right now <laughs> I would have to say the first two seasons of the show which is like pre-diagnosis she's such a good example of someone who can be very unhealthy and I have a lot of friends who have told what to watch the show and they're like, I just can't because she's so annoying and she's so like, she just is so, she's so self-sabotaging. I just can't stand to watch this self-sabotage happen over and over again. Um, so I've had a lot of friends give up after the first season and I'm like, no, just wait it. Cause it gets so much better and it's feels natural. I mean, she gets better pretty quickly. Quickly, I have to say, like after her diagnosis, which isn't maybe the most realistic thing, but I love that they do show how much you can grow. Like 
how much having the diagnosis and going through therapy, because the therapy is a big part of the show too, how much you can become, you know, like a much healthier person. I think another interesting thing about this show, and I feel like we've talked about this before, but how it really like kind of shows how BPD or personality disorders are just sort of a, an extension from, you know, normal human behavior, because there are other characters in the show who do not have BPD who also struggle, right? Like her best friend in the show is the one who's often egging her on and, and at some points wanting to do more reckless behavior than Rebecca herself does. You know, and also the fact that she's like, she's functional, right? She's like a high profile lawyer and she's, you know, makes all, you know, ton of money and stuff like, you know, it really just shows how people with BPD can exist in various places in life, right? And that it's often something that the people around you don't notice because you know, they struggle with their own stuff. Right, and I think it sort of emphasizes that, like, so the contextual nature, like for so many of us, it's the romantic relationships where the the real dysfunction comes out. And that I think that was the thing that I really related to. You know, some of the things that she does, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'd do that, but I did something pretty dang similar. So there's a scene where after she gets her diagnosis and she starts to get better, she's faced with the situation where someone wants to be with her and she feels so afraid because she's afraid of falling back into the same patterns. Um, and the doctor kind of says to her, you're a different person than the last time, like when you tried. And she's like, I'm not. Like I'm a slightly saner version of the person that I was. I'm barely even holding on to that. I mean, honestly, I'm afraid. And then the doctor basically says to her, well, you can't live your life without int intimacy. You need and you deserve love and it's okay to have it. And she's like, no, I can't, you don't understand. I don't wanna die, okay? I've gotten better, I've progressed. I know that this relationship is different than the other one. Maybe he'll go out to dinner with a friend, he won't answer my texts, or he'll go on a trip and he won't call me enough. But I know what I'm capable of when I feel abandoned. I can go to a really dark place and it's a place where I can hurt myself. I never wanna be in that place again, ever. And that for me is like, like even reading right now is giving me chills because that is just such a relatable moment. That's the moment where it's like, you know, you have so much more self-awareness and awareness of your patterns. And you realize that maybe you could, maybe you could be different, but it's such a fear of falling back to that really dark place that can happen and things that can happen in relationships. And then there's also this scene where she kind of goes through like two breakups, either in succession or kind of at once. And she's talking to her friend and she's like, I don't know who I am without them. And her friend says to her, like, you know, just be yourself. And she was like, ew, why would I want to do that? A big theme in the show is also just her searching for who she is. So it's like really, really shows that lack of a stable identity and identity disturbance. I really want to watch this show now. I was going to say, what's funny about it is it's like, it's a, it's a, kind of a comedy right and it's a it's a musical it's a um, musical because i don't usually like musicals <laughs> yeah it's a musical a lot of it you know it's very like silly like there's a song called like the sexy getting ready song you know it's it's very it's very like silly at the same time that has these really hard-hitting moments there's a one song that was my actually my favorite song and i sing it all the time it's called you stupid bitch and she taught it's like the <laughs> lyrics are you ruined everything you stupid bitch like she calls herself a poopy little slut <laughs> who lives in a dream. And it's, yeah, it's just like a song about shame. It's all about shame and like feeling terrible for things that you've done when you're in a state that's dysregulated. Effect on stigma? What's everyone's opinion? I mean, there's moments where like, because it's very dramatized and a lot, like some of the things she does are very dramatized. It might, like it really like buys into that crazy ex-girlfriend you know, stigma. And it's, I mean, it's called crazy ex-girlfriend. I think it's kind of supposed to be called that ironically, because you realize through watching it, like, you don't feel like she's crazy after a while. It's like, oh, like, I, I like this character. Like, you actually really root for her. Um, so like, it's good and bad. I think if you watch all of it, it ends up being good because like the way things end up is just I think it ends up really nicely. I would agree exactly what you said. I think that, again, it's a TV show, right? It's not, if it were an actual depiction of BPD, maybe it wouldn't be that exciting to watch. Overall, it's probably the best depiction I've seen. 
And the only thing I would add is it's a very externalized expression. If you watch the show and you walk away from it thinking that's how people with BPD behave, you know, you're sort of cutting out a huge group that are much more internalized and don't do a lot of the more outward expressing things. I definitely relate to her, but I, I know that a lot of people might not. Like what, like the internalized, externalized thing, what is? Often people who externalize will seem to have no connection to the emotional experience of what they're having. There will just be the external part, whether that's the anger or um, self-destructiveness or whatever. It's sort of like a way of, you know, often as therapists, like we see it as a way of maybe avoiding the emotional experience by turning it into an outward expression. Whereas people who internalize, you're not seeing a lot on the surface, right? And so that's why a lot of people who are internalizers won't get um, diagnosed maybe as quickly as an externalizer would because there's a lot happening that they're not expressing. And then I just want to add to that there's people who are who do fall in between. Yeah, so I was going to ask that. Like, it's more of like a spectrum sort of thing. Yeah, like I've definitely had periods in my life where I've been on either end. Since we just talked about an externalizer, Jay... Tell us all about Susanna. So it's based on a memoir, right? That was written in an earlier part of the, the 1990s. It's an example of a character with BPD that's kind of pushes against a lot of the stigmatizing attitudes I found anyway. Um, and I found that quite surprising for a very early representation. Susanna, I think is around 19, if I remember rightly. I don't think they explicitly say that in the movie, but she's quite young. They show her graduating from high school. She attempts... Uh, suicide although she she kind of re, uh, resists on several occasions to state that that's what she was doing she goes to see this psychiatrist who's a friend of her her parents she has like a 20 minute kind of consultation with this guy and immediately she is uh, committed to a psychiatric unit right and i feel like that resonates a lot with um especially women that were diagnosed with BPD like very early on in, in its history, I guess, right? And the movie kind of grapples with those things. And I, I've always I kind of appreciated how like I've related to Susanna a lot because like I am quite an internalized person and i think across both this uh, movie and the the example that we just talked about um something that really stands out is like the reflection element right like both of these people are very self-aware and reflective of what is happening to them and what they're going through um and that was something that i like related to a lot and i think pushes against the 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 grain of what a lot of people often think about bpd because it's portrayed in a way that's almost like you're you lack empathy, you don't care about other people's feelings, all of those kinds of things. It actually could not be further from the truth. <laughs> How do you think the BPD symptoms are represented? I remember there was a moment at the end of the movie where I was like, there it is. <laughs> like, now I see it because she has like a little bit of a breakdown. But before then, like, it is harder to see it because it is very much internalized. So obviously there's the suicidal piece. So, uh, she had an episode where she attempted to take her own life by taking an overdose. I remember like her having bandages around her, her wrist. So I wondered if um, she had also self injured. Um, so that could be another way that the symptoms uh, are being portrayed. But I remember when she, she goes and has a, um, a therapy session with is it Dr. Wicks. There's a psychiatrist that she starts to become closer to and Dr. Wick like looking through her chart notes and she she reads out this quotation that Susanna had given about um feeling like life is quicksands right and that to me was like dissociation like when you feel like your whole world is kind of like like you're it's slipping away from you right like you're losing grasp of where you are in those moments and stuff and that like really shouted out to me it's like, oh my God, yeah, that is, that is exactly it. That is exactly what this feels like. In terms of like other um, symptoms, a lot of her, her reactions to things and her feelings seem pretty rational for what she's experiencing. 
And one thing that I like about the movie is I don't feel that through the movie we're invited to judge them otherwise. I feel like we're not being invited to see her as excessive. And that might be because it's because it's based on a memoir, right? That that, that personal element shines through. Because I, I, I didn't feel that her her sexual kind of activity, for example, was excessive, but it was always framed that way. I think it's a really interesting time capsule for like how BPD was considered by psychiatrists in the 60s. Like it was, it, erratic sexual behavior was like, if you had that, you had BPD. Like it was very much about, and it was like a cis woman's disease or disorder, right? Like it was women who are erratic sexually aren't like aren't fitting in aren't doing what they're expected you know are like displaying sort of non-ladylike behaviors like that was BPD and some of that became you know we've we've started to develop that into a better understanding of like that reckless behavior is a sign of you know BPD but it's not just about the sexual element. I think also it's hard to judge too because she the entire movie takes place in an inpatient facility. Yeah as someone who's been inpatient I can say I don't think I had all that many freakouts and when I was there and and most of them were going to be pretty similar just like lashing out at the people working there for trying to get me to do something that I wasn't ready to do. I think there was one scene in the film where I felt like maybe an inappropriate anger was displayed and that's when she's in the bathtub yelling horrible horrible things to one of the nurses who's been like really trying to support her and she just goes off i think is worth mentioning too is angelina jolie's character lisa rowe i mean she displays a lot of antisocial personality traits um but at the same time, she also displays like an even more like stereotypical portrayal of BPD as well. A lot of people can have both antisocial personality disorder and they can also at the same time have BPD. So it's um, like I just I see a lot of things in her that were like, wow, she has a lot of traits of BPD, too. Yeah, that was that was weird to me. I, I was watching the movie the whole time. I'm like, Susanna's reactions seem pretty justified. I really relate to this other character. Not the coldness, but like just the lashing out and pushing other people's buttons. And when I watch it, there's a scene where a character passes away and Lisa's reaction is extremely cold. And I'm watching that as the person I am now going like, yeesh, how, like, that's horrible. How can she be that way? But I, if I think back to when I was like really, really dysregulated, there were times when things would be almost like so emotionally overwhelming that I would just turn it off and act like I didn't care about anyone or anything because that was the only way that I could think of to get through that moment because if I accepted the emotion and accepted the loss or accepted the pain I thought I would just fall apart. You know this is a great example of how the lines between diagnoses are very subjective. Um, the criteria themselves are written in a very subjective way and the way that an individual person is going to experience things is going to be so varied. Um, and so, you know, you could see BPD traits in pretty much anyone in that movie, in a way. I feel like it would have a pretty good effect on stigma. I mean, I think that it's a good representation of a very different presentation of BPD, the one that's not the stereotypical presentation of BPD. And even like, it's hard because it's a movie, so we don't know, we don't know what's going on inside of her head. We can't ask her that. Um, but if that's what she's diagnosed with, then you know, that's what it's going to be portrayed to the audience. Maybe the audience can see that BPD isn't always just explosion after explosion. And I also feel like, you know, it also shows that BPD is not, it's not entirely just about the person that's suffering from it. I feel like in Susanna's case, she is often really heavily impacted by the other, the people around her and the things that they're experiencing, especially Lisa is, a, is one of the most intense examples of that. It's important to show that, right? That like sometimes how we, how we act and how we come to, come to like our difficult moments, like it's heavily influenced by what's going on around us. It's not just this kind of innate thing that sits inside of us that's waiting to like go bang.
Yeah. So the character that I looked into is Dex from the third season of Daredevil. For those of you who don't know, um, Daredevil is a superhero show. Dex starts out the season as an FBI agent. And over the course of the season, the big bad guy, his name is Wilson Fisk. He manipulates Dex into becoming a villain. So you would think that since he's an FBI agent, he's like a good guy, but your very first impression of him is when he kills two suspects who are in the process of surrendering. Um, and shortly after that, you see that he is apparently stalking somebody. Dex's history, as you find out over the course of the show, he was orphaned at a young age, kills his baseball coach, his therapist diagnoses him with BPD and psycho uh, psychopathic tendencies after he discloses that he killed his coach on purpose. He even expresses a desire to kill his therapist when she has to end their sessions due to a terminal illness. The therapist's response is basically, you know, your compass isn't broken. It just works better when you have someone to guide you. So go and find someone who can replace me. And so for a while, Dex replaces her with the army and the FBI. At a certain point, his place in his work becomes really unstable and he starts to unravel a little bit. You find out that the woman he's been stalking, he's been stalking her because as he explains it, he is trying to use her as that North Star and try to emulate her by being good. He begs her to help him, which she agrees to, but then the big bad guy uh, has her killed. And so Dex thinks that she abandoned him. And then Fisk basically has Dex isolated from everyone and everything and manipulates him into being a villain who he can put all the blame for all of his wrongdoings on. And because Dex has a strong fear of abandonment, he basically is willing to do anything to make sure that Fisk doesn't leave him. Um, although he has very clear murderous intent throughout the whole series, so it's not that much of a stretch. It's hard for me to say how psychopathic tendencies would change things, but from a BPD perspective, it looks like somebody read the DSM page for BPD once, then did not think about it for a year, and then was like, I vaguely remember some of this. I'm going to make a character based on that. I want to talk for a second about the scene where he's diagnosed um, with BPD because, first of all, he's a child in this scene. I am. I know that like research suggests that BPD can reliably be diagnosed in teenagers, but he is a child, like a clear child in this scene. And also similar to to what Jay was saying with Susanna Kaysen when she was diagnosed after like a brief conversation, like this is his first time meeting this therapist. She's talking, they're talking for like a little bit and he's just, she just writes down borderline personality disorder as like that simple, like that's how quickly we're going to get to this diagnosis. Like not even ruling out anything else. Rule outs are very important when you're diagnosing people. You don't want to just like be stuck on one diagnosis. It's very important to think about other potential diagnoses. So that's very quick. And then she writes down psychopathic tendencies, which I think in that scene, I mean, are a lot clearer. I mean, he's saying to the doctor, like, I killed him on purpose. Like, you're not worried by that. And he, so those are a lot clearer in that scene. I do think that, you know, when he threatens to kill his therapist because she's going to die, I mean, the fear of abandonment is very, very palpable there. Look, I think in terms of representing this in a show, like if we want to have good representations of BPD, maybe it's not the best to make BPD characters like these really psychopathic killers. They didn't really think about the motivations behind a lot of the behaviors and the traits. And for me, like the scene with the therapist, that whole scene does not make sense because at least from my perspective, I can totally understand Want the feeling of wanting to punish someone for hurting you or leaving you. I feel like that was a big motivation for a lot of my extreme behavior, but it all came from a place of wanting someone to understand my pain so that they could meet me where I was. And to me, if you kill somebody, like it totally defeats the purpose of that whole behavior. They can't apologize to you. They can't make it better. You've just cut that whole thing off. There's no lesson for them to learn to get better. And, and I realized like, that that dual diagnosis may totally change the flavor 
But I think, yeah, in terms of representing BPD, like the average person does not know where BPD ends and psychopathic tendencies begin. Like they walk away from the scene thinking, oh my gosh, people with BPD are crazy psychopaths who just want to go kill people. It feels like they, they, they labeled the psychopathic element as tendencies, right? When it seems a little bit more the other way around. <laughs> like there's BPD traits or tendencies, right? But the psychopathic element is more, is far more dominant. It feels like they pretty much what Zani said earlier on, like it feels like they looked at the, uh, the criteria, maybe abandoned them, really stuck with them and they thought, let's take that and mold everything else around it. <laughs> If you suspend your thoughts about everything else, the one thing that I think was like pretty well done was how far he was willing to go when he thought that Fisk was literally the only person who understood him. There's a moment when the hero, Daredevil, tells him that Fisk killed this woman that he was obsessed with. And he, for a long time, doesn't believe it. His initial thought is, no, there's no way he would do that. And I, that was one part where I felt like I could relate to the emotion in that moment. That, like, just complete denial of red flags of the person that you're idealizing, right? Like, oh, there's no way. Mm -mm. No, he's perfect. He's done everything to help me. Like, and and Dex, Ben, he, he does things he's not even asked to do just to try to make sure that he is indispensable to Fisk and that he does not get discarded and abandoned. Um, and that was one thing that I, I could relate to, but it took a really long time to get there. And it was hard to feel sorry for him because the way they had the actor play the character was just so, you know, he had like a creepy evil grin when he was stalking the woman. You know, when he runs, uh, runs up to the woman that he wanted to share his feelings with. I don't know about you, but I felt that his response to her, although perhaps very intense for sure, showed a, showed some empathy in a way, right? I know it's not how it was kind of being intended, but it showed like he was very aware that what he was doing was likely frightening her. And he was trying to communicate to her that like, he just had a real need and he had nobody and he wanted to talk to her. I do think that one, that scene was done very, very well. And, but it was like one scene out of 13 episodes, you know, like that scene is, I think in episode eight. So by the time you see that scene, you've, you've had eight episodes of him just being really creepy. I wished that they had shown more of that struggle and emotion earlier. Um, because at that point it just felt a little too little too late <laughs> people in the audience they their takeaway from the show is wow people with bpd are murderous non-empathetic psycho freaks it's pretty bad for bpd stigma yeah it's just bad representation so was that it for the like actual ones with diagnoses no welcome to me welcome to me um so welcome to me is about a woman who um we learn pretty on is diagnosed with BPD. She lives alone and has a lot of interesting um, habits. She watches old reruns and like regular showings of Oprah's show and will like quote along to it. Um, she organizes her apartment by color because she says it organizes her emotions she buys a lottery ticket every day she goes to like her local corner store every day and always buys an oprah magazine and a lottery ticket one day she buys the winning ticket and she wins 86 million dollars or whatever so with her money she decides to start her own talk show called welcome to me which is just about herself and so we see kind of like the how that plays out and like you know how she makes a show about herself. It's a very, you know, it's very interesting depiction. I think she's very clearly also an autistic person. At first when I was watching it, I was like, this girl does not have BPD. And then after a while, like certain things start to show up. Um, so in a way, it's like a very interesting depiction of that overlap between autism and BPD. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a very, very strange movie for sure oh the other thing was that drove me bananas 
was that they drew a parallel between bipolar disorder and BPD. They were like, it was called bipolar and then it was called rapid cycling and now it's called borderline personality disorder. And I was like, no wonder people can't tell the difference. There's movies like this out there who literally call them the same thing and they are not. Yeah, this is very clearly another movie where, like, they read the the DSM, or they might not have even done that, and they were like, oh, yeah, this is clearly BPD. Um, when I, yeah, like I was saying, I see more of the autistic traits, like, especially the restrictive, repetitive behaviors, like, her, she does the same routine every day, and she can't move it, and certainly people with BPD can have sort of, like, restrictive aspects in our personality, but... Yeah, it's it's a very confusing diagnostic picture for sure. I mean, no hate to Kristen Wiig because she's she's an incredible actress, but she had this um, interview that I watched on YouTube yesterday that was like how you know how important it was her it was for her to be portraying this mental like a mental illness on a show, and I'm like, yeah, but you could have, have at least tried to get it right. <laughs> I think maybe they were trying to do the whole over disclosure thing, but. But she does it pretty indiscriminately of social cues. And I feel like most people with BPD, you know, their reactions may not be the same, but we do tend to be relatively sensitive to the uh, to the facial expressions of other people, sometimes excessively so. Before you mentioned overexposure. Overdisclosure. Overdisclosure, that's it, yeah. Overdisclosure. I, like, oversharing. Yeah, like, she... She goes, so, like, bef before she starts her own show, she goes on, like, um, she's, like, a, an, aud an audience member in, you know, like, some sort of, like, infomercial, and they ask for someone to come up, and she just sort of, like, runs up. She doesn't wait to get called on or whatever, um, and she starts talking about herself and sharing just very intimate details. Like, I think she says, like, I've been using masturbation as a sedative since 1991 or something like that. She's, like, constantly doing that throughout the movie, just, like, sharing very intimate details about herself sort of indiscriminately. So we'd say this is, like, a negative depiction then? Because I'm feeling like, what was it? The dead of a one, Dex, was quite negative because it kind of, took out all took away all nuance and all sort of like sense of how it was and then this one welcome to me is neither good nor bad it's just messy it's not it i i don't even i don't even know if they like had any idea about what bpd bpd is before they went into it like if if they never sh told us that she had bpd in the movie like you would definitely not watch it and be like oh this woman clearly has BPD. So there's the stigma that people with BPD are very attention seeking. And, you know, sometimes we can be attention seeking in certain ways, but this her attention seeking in the movie is like, like to the extreme that she wants a show about herself. And that's like, that's just not it. That's not the kind of attention seeking that, that, you know, is really with BPD. I came away from the show feeling, or from the movie, feeling like the message was, People with BPD are selfish and self-absorbed and uh, the only way they'll give you anything is if you, th like, threaten to end the relationship, basically, because that's what happens. Um, and I thought that was not a great message. Yeah, I think I was willing to give a little more credit because I was thinking about, you know, from my own perspective as somebody who, like, has a little more awareness of BPD, but I'm thinking now, you know, that you brought it up, like, if the, reg you know, whatever person off the street watched it, they would be like, oh, pe yeah, people with BPD are super selfish. If they're gonna bother giving them a real diagnosis, interview at least one person, one everyday person with lived experience, you know, like, otherwise... Just make up a name for something that doesn't exist. Like, that's my personal opinion, right? Like, the name of the disorder doesn't really matter if you're making it up what it is anyway. There's no need to be creating stigma for people, for real people, who are actually suffering with these things. Oh, it almost feels like they're, like, jumping on the back of the stigma to push the movie a little bit more. Like, it's like, people know, people, like, if we say she has BPD people are going to kind of already have an idea of that and we have free reign to make this character do what we need her to do. 
Zanny said something about like, you know, not even needing to label anything. I think that there's a lot of movies where that there's no given diagnosis of BPD that are actually much better representations of BPD than the movies where the diagnosis is given. Yeah, so what are some examples of those media portrayals? A lot of people know about the movie Fatal Attraction, and that's like a really highly stigmatizing movie um, where, you know, a lot of people believe that the main character has BPD. But other than that, I know a number of different movies. Like, um, I know the character in Silver Linings Playbook, which I haven't fully seen, so I don't know, I don't have much to say about that, but I've heard that that's a good representation of BPD. Um, and I, the movie uh, Prozac Nation, which I want to talk about for a little bit, because I, I watched that and I... I feel like I was literally watching myself in a movie. Um, and I remember watching that movie when I was in high school because the whole idea of the movie is it's about this girl who's depressed. Um, but I remember watching that movie in high school because I I thought I was also only experiencing depression in high school. So I watched it with, like expecting one thing and then actually being like, okay, this is definitely not depression. Um, like I, I know, I knew enough even at that time to be like, this is not depression. But I also really resonate with this character a lot. Um, so I wanted to rewatch it before this. And I literally like there was moments I paused it because I was just crying because it was just felt so real. Um, there is just so much in the movie that like demonstrates BPD. I mean, at one point she's talking to her therapist and she says, most people, they cut themselves and they put a bandaid on it. Keep going. And then she says, I just keep bleeding. Um, and that was like, wow, what a way to describe the way that our emotions are. And then she also really just falls so deeply for this boy that she's dating. And she says um, something that I thought was really profound. She says, real love is total. It's like life or death. You know you will die when you are apart because the need is so pure, so complete. It's like that feeling of like you're going to die without that person. Yeah, that whole relationship I felt like was very spot on. And one of the things that I really appreciated about the way that they showed some of her outburst was like, you could see the inner workings of like what was happening with her, you know, like she would lash out and then almost immediately be like, oh, no, what is wrong with me? Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say to say that that internal struggle was sort of played out externally. Um, probably for the sake of the audience, but I really appreciated that because I think a lot of times with characters, you don't get to see that other flip side because my experience has, has been a lot of like what she did where it's like you lash out at somebody and inside you're like, shut, shuds, I was not trying to say it like that. Like, well, I'm just making the situation worse. Um, and, and I think that that has, that's been missing in so many depictions. So that was really, really, really good to see. Yeah. I mean, I've had a lot of those moments where I say something and then right after, maybe not the second afterwards, but I'm like, oh my God, like, I'm, I'm so sorry. And she said at one point, she's like, I hate myself. And that's the moment I started crying because that just like, I felt like I was watching myself fall apart. Yeah, that's a pretty intense, relatable moment for me too, for sure. Um, Raf, you watched Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, right? Yeah. Just as a side note, I think this movie is so interesting because the premise is basically you have this couple, Joel and Clementine, who uh, break up and the memories of each other and their relationship are so painful that they opt to undergo like a medical procedure to forget each other. And when I was watching this movie, I was just thinking, man... There are some times in my life I really could have used that technology. <laughs> um, but anyway, Raf, what did you think? Clementine, like, has BPD, falls into a relationship with somebody who apparently has avoidant personality disorder, um, played by Jim Carrey. And it was interesting watching it, because when they meet, she's very much outgoing, outwardly trying to get this random guy's attention and flipping back and forth between like interested to immediately offended by being called nice, which seems to be a trigger word for her within like 10 minutes, just having back and forth between like positive and negative emotions, if you want to put it through that. So yeah, you see her in the earlier parts, I think kind of moving more towards like the whole like manic pixie dream girl sort of trope. But later, like in other scenes, you see her, um, her and Jim Carrey's character, um, walking through a market, they were talking about like kids, Jim Carrey's character, 
in like a fairly insensitive sort of way goes like do you really think you'd be able to be a mother or something like that um and she almost understandably like she has a big reaction to it and like an argument does break out from it in public he him i guess being like the avoidant one in here is like no let's not talk about this now let's go back home blah blah, blah. and she effectively like explodes on the situation um it is pictured in a way it is put to uh, put in a way where it does feel like an extreme reaction but while watching it i was kind of like if somebody said to me while we're walking i'd like said like oh kids that would be great if someone said to me like do you think you would be able to be a mother like do you really think you would be able to do that and then kind of follow that on with sort of like pushing that discussion away and being like we're not gonna talk about this now we're in public she even mentions like how are you supposed to how are you gonna say something like that and then be like no we're gonna we're gonna talk about it later how do you how would you expect anyone to react and that was kind of what i felt in that situation i'm kind of for the depiction even though it's like an unofficial like diagnosis for her like it's a non-canonical um I'm almost for it because it does show at least what I feel is some of those things like those emotions and those emotions, I guess, like, like you do kind of go through. I mean, from the very start of the movie, I thought she gave an incredible example of an unstable self image. She's talking about how she dyes her hair all the time. And she literally says, I apply my personality in a paste, like referring to dyeing her hair. And I just thought that was just like such a wonderful description. I used to do that. <laughs> I still do that. <laughs> kind of <laughs> oh yeah that's the thing like it is like the stuff that's put forward in kind of like within dialogue and within narrative storytelling is how some of her symptoms end up being like told and how you can get to those conclusions and i feel like that's done really well without it without it being pointed out and without her being villainized we all know the disorder from living it right so we can see but like, I don't know, in terms of stigma, I wonder if it's effect in destigmatizing the disorder or, or things like that is sort of, um, it almost becomes a bit redundant if, if the disorder is not named in a way, because people, people that are outside of this experience don't have something to frame it by. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, um, well, that's, I was thinking that with um, the whole, her kind of just being framed as the Manny Pixie Dream Girl thing um without the diagnosis there just kind of a quirky girl or that sort of thing and then people can kind of go on being like oh i'm just being kind of quirky blah 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 this sort of stuff like you've got a good point like the diagnosis being there would help reframe it more as far as like it being represented these movies are ones that they probably didn't approach it being like, okay, we're going to have a character with BPD. Like they probably didn't even think about that. It's just how the character ended up being. And it's like, we're also talking about ones that we, that we like, like um, representations that we like. So it's, it's like, I th I mean, yes, it would be so incredible if they had the diagnosis in these movies, because these are actually good representations of it. Um, but it's like, probably wasn't their goal you know i think something that's just helpful generally is knowing that these movies exist so that if you know if you're someone with bpd who kind of wants to show someone like an example of bpd in film like you can use these movies to show someone even though they don't necessarily have the diagnosis you can just say like these are behaviors and you know experiences that are things i've experienced as well and without even it needing a name it's like i i uh, really resonate with this experience. You know, the question of like, sh whether people are diagnosed in the media or not is like, it's a great question, because I think we're getting such a limited depiction of who they are as a person. Maybe a character like Clem on Eternal Sunshine as well as mine is like, a depiction where we get more of her story and more of what's happening, you know, internally, but we don't always get that. And so what's hard is that a lot of, you know, a lot of times we're making assumptions off of limited information. And so, you know, I think being able to have the information is helpful. And I think a lot of 
the time what happens when TV shows and movies, you know, decide to make a character with BPD, they create such a horrible depiction of it. So it's like, sometimes it's better when they just are just naturally a person, you know, because it's not a stereotype. I think the approach of create the character and then if some label fits, give it to them afterwards is maybe the better approach rather than working from the label. Because I think it just makes them more three-dimensional when you create a, a real person and then... Yeah. I think that's the thing. If you're going to write from the diagnosis, you need to know the diagnosis back to front. Otherwise, you're going to get it wrong. But if you're going to write a person, you're hopefully going to know that person back to front. And then if the diagnosis comes in, it's probably going to be a better representation. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching. Hopefully you got a nugget of information from this episode and that moving forwards, you know, if you see characters with a BPD label, you don't have to think that they're representing you. They're representing some writer's version of what they think BPD is, right? You don't need to take that on. Um, next week, we will be back for our very last episode of this season. Be back for that. Make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you do not miss anything. Again, thank you so much to our patrons for voting for this topic for this episode. We had so much fun watching all these movies, and it was a great time. So we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.